Combat has been a part of history longer than history itself. A battle between predator and prey, human and non-human, between country and country, conflict as a whole is an inevitable part of nature. Through hundreds of years of combat and tactics, humanity found one of the best ways to avoid death is to avoid being seen at all. If an opponent in any way doesn't know you're there, you have every opportunity. Opportunity to engage, opportunity to ambush, and opportunity to avoid the fight altogether. And so, the Age of Stealth was born. From the ambush tactics of ancient humans all the way into the modern age, people have found various ways to visually cloak themselves. Deformed and environmentally colored paint designed to break silhouettes, dazzling lines designed to confuse range and direction, as well as nets of leaves and brush to altogether cloak a target have been ways of avoiding visual detection, gaining the upper hand in combat, or sometimes avoiding casualty altogether. Concealment and stealth have become invaluable to the tactics and warfare of man in the Second World War. In the age of aircraft becoming ever so useful, there is no real way to conceal aircraft or aviation altogether. Attempts for ultra-quiet nighttime blimps and see-through planes of World War I were only failures, and it was thought to be improbable that air vehicles could ever be concealed. Fast forward to 1940. The Nazis are preparing for one of the largest strategic bombing campaigns against Britain. Navigation during the nighttime was a little bit complicated in an aircraft, as navigating by the stars was nearly impossible, and navigating by compass was very limited, especially with any shred of accuracy to a bombing target. Other than the basic IFR pilotage you can do, there is no way to accurately bomb a target at night. So doing night raids as a method of concealment was out of the question. The Germans, however, had developed a new technology to counter this. Two large beam emitters were stationed with a large parallax aimed at a bombing target. The German bombers would follow the single from one of the beams until the second beam intercepted the craft. This allowed the bombers to determine their bearing and location over the target. It was known as radio navigation, and it allowed for the unthinkable to happen. The first real stealth aircraft, or the night bombers. During the Blitz, London was bombed for over 57 consecutive nights and sometimes during the day too. The inability to respond to these night raids proved difficult for the British. One of the biggest inventions to turn the battle in the British favor, however, was the radar. The ability to spot German aircraft beyond visual range, or BVR, helped British pilots over the radio shoot down German aircraft before they could reach mainland Britain. Ever since that moment, the radar has changed the world. From weather reports, advanced aircraft spotting, and home appliances, the radar has truly made its impact. Let's fast forward another 30 years. With the invention of advanced radars such as pulse Doppler radars, which listen for wave compression caused by moving aircraft, as well as moving target indicators, radar became a near impossibility to dodge. The ability to identify a target, lock it, and guide a BVR missile into it with a radar that was near impossible to jam by the way was an increasing threat day by day, peaking with ASA and even more advanced radars. But we found a way. Introducing the Stealth Fighter. Equipped with advanced coatings, designed with special shaping, and including some of the coolest engineering in my opinion, these aircraft have concealed their attacks through themselves. Introducing the LF-27 Longsword. Using advanced sensors, aerodynamics, shaping, and avionics, this vehicle could theoretically avoid radar detection and maintain the upper hand in combat. But there is a catch to the LF-27. It's not real. The LF-27 is a conceptual aircraft I designed, tested, and flew in a realistic aviation design game, Flyout. I am using this game as a medium to simulate the custom-made stealth fighter that I spent far more time than I'd like to admit building. From radar shaping, internal bays, fly-by-wire, and an advanced cockpit simulated sensors, a billion more things we'll get into in the video, I was able to cobble together my very own stealth fighter, and today I'm going to show you guys how. But before I show you guys how I made it, we need to think about what this aircraft aims to be doing and why I built it the way I did. So unless we want to build a plane without a purpose, I should probably start by telling you guys what this thing aims to accomplish. 
First things first, this aircraft was classified as a lightweight multi-role stealth aircraft. This jumble of words I just made up seven seconds ago essentially means three things. Stealth, versatility, and relative cost efficiency. We can break the aircraft into these three segments to understand what we are doing. Firstly, stealth. Obviously in shape and design, this is a stealth fighter. Simulated ram coating, advanced sensor systems, and internal weapon space, and flare pods, and other otherwise external systems would need to be included on the longsword, inside of its fuselage. On top of this, a theoretical, at least, cooling and thermal stealth systems will be mentioned. After this is versatility. As a multi-role aircraft, the longsword needed to be capable of air-to-air -air and air-to-ground rolls. It needed stealth, payload, visibility, ease of use, ease of maintenance, and compatibility with non-stealth missions. It needed a powerful engine with a high thrust to weight, a large wing area, and vortex generators for added lift, as well as external hardpoint mounting capabilities. Lastly, relative cost efficiency. This is a problem with a lot of stealth planes actually, their upkeep costs are insane. The ram coating in its inherently ferrous nature, the axis panels needing to be covered up for stealth, and the advanced systems being entirely internal led to some insane operating costs for these aircraft. We will be doing everything we can to include ease of access, low turbine operation costs at cruise, as well as some other features to hopefully design the longsword to be as easy to maintain as possible. Besides the missile base, more on that later though. Think of this lightweight multi-role stealth fighter classification such as the LF-27 to be the same role you'd expect to see in F-35 or a similar style aircraft in. Able to do air-to-air, air-to-ground for a sustainably low price than other similar stealth fighters. So what exactly does it take to design a stealth fighter like this? Well, let's find out. Take a look at this. This is the LF-27 Longsword, the plane I mentioned earlier. This stealth fighter incorporates S-ducted intakes, a V-tail, and low aspect wings swept back to reduce frontal RCS. On top of this, it features both internal and external capable payloads for all stealth and non-stealth mission needs. Automatic opening of missile launch doors, a gun door, as well as automatic closing for radar decoys, countermeasures, ensured the aircraft was as invisible as possible right up until the time to strike. Special stealth features such as radar absorbent materials, sealed panel gaps, and other features also simulated in the design. To see without being seen, ASA radar, MAW, and IR search sensors were also simulated all along the sides and back of the aircraft, enabling the operator to have eyes on the backs of their heads. To provide as much power as possible, an advanced variable cycle afterburning turbofan providing insane amounts of thrust was also included on the craft. And lastly, to top it all off, advanced fly-by-wire systems that could augment everything from lateral flight stability to the trim and flaps, to even the individual drag brake angle was added to the vehicle so that the pilot could focus on internal activities with a full glass cockpit and HMD. As mentioned before, the game I will be using to simulate this aircraft's design is Flyout. Flyout is a very realistic flight building game that allows you to build your procedural monstrosities and abuse its physics engine to the maximum. Link to the development server in the description below. With that out of the way, let's move on to specifics of how I built this thing along with some in-flight science, dynamics, and experiments. Let's start with the airframe and what makes it stealth. To understand that, we need to know the basics of how a radar works if we want to avoid it, of course. Essentially, a radar works by sending electromagnetic waves out of an emitter towards a target. These, typically microwaves, travel through the air, yet reflect off of solid surfaces. This reflected beam bounces back to the radar source and is picked up by the sensor. Imagine screaming into the darkness blindfolded and listening for an echo. This is essentially how a radar works, but with electromagnetic waves instead of audio waves. Or, you know, just standard air compression, you could call it. But normally, flying close to the ground or deploying chaff, a larger radar signal, would be enough to confuse these radars. After all, the ground trees and mountains also reflect radar waves, so it should be enough to cloak your aircraft. In the modern age, however, radars can detect the differences between a tree or chaff through moving target indicators and pulse dopplers. Essentially, by watching the target movement and observing the compression of the waves via the Doppler effect, radars can differentiate between a moving and stationary target, therefore being able to pick up your fighter jet through all the other clutter that may be present. 
Because of this, conventional, non-stealth countermeasures don't exactly work against the modern radar. This is why stealth is required to avoid detection or tracking. Imagine the world around you is all coarse, reflective surfaces in complete darkness and you've got nothing but a flashlight in your hand. Anything that reflects your flashlight beam directly back at you is visible. Something like a sphere, for example, will always reflect light back at you due to having infinite sides. Rounded objects, for example, are always visible on radar because of this. Let's say, instead, you're looking at a wedge. The tip of the wedge, of course, is facing you. The light wouldn't necessarily have a side that reflects at you since the angles divert the light either up or down. Therefore, this wedge in front of you stays hidden. This exact property is what stealth aircraft use to cloak the front of their vehicles, and it's also why the leading edges of aircraft such as the B-2 are wedge-shaped instead of rounded. Now, many of you might be saying, but Messier, what if we change the wedge's angle? Certainly there will be a way to view the wedge, right? Well, yes, you would be correct. A stealth plane from the flat faces of the top or bottom isn't exactly stealthy in shape. Stealth planes are designed to be stealth from angles mostly seen by radars, however, not just any angle. There is seldom a situation where the radar will see the direct top or bottom of a stealth fighter. Even if it does, it will only be for a few moments. Because of this, RCS from the exact top and bottom isn't exactly a high priority. Especially when you literally have to get rid of things like wings in order to increase that. Instead, the designers of stealth aircraft focus mostly on frontal and side angles with a healthy cone of elevation on either vertical axis of that. Flyout does in fact have an in-game stealth rating tool, but it's not perfect, nor is it even that great for most angles. You see, in-game, the stealth rating tool takes the angles from the direct top, bottom, sides, front and back. Because of this, most stealth aircraft have a pretty low stealth score, just because of that top and bottom angle. This is because it's calculated due to flat angles it measures from. For example, let's um, rotate this cube. So instead, I will be making my own custom 360 RCS graphs, painstakingly. In terms of shape, here is a pretty typical RCS graph. This one takes a 3D model of an F-35, all with the same material assumption, and graphs its radar return from every angle. Well, every angle on a flat plane. You'll notice that the smallest is around the front, getting slightly larger towards the wings of the aircraft, a typical and very small stealth RCS. So what I did is I manually, degree by degree, measured and graphed a radar return measurement. And then after I imported that to my own personal Polar Coordinates Excel graph, courtesy of uh, Aquila on my server for giving that to me, but essentially this allowed me to simulate my own model of what it should look like. This took a lot of time, but so did all of this build. The build itself took me over 40 hours, including all the research inputs and building. Whatever it took for this god-awful graph, YouTube and recording the voiceover, who knows. Anyways, the LF-27's return looked something like this. As you can see, it is smaller than the F-35's from direct frontal angles, but gets larger towards the back and it has an unusual rounded shape around by comparison. This is because in the game there are no stealth turbine nozzles, as well as the inclusion of traditional turbining afterburner flame tube to increase the RCS. It's not a surprise that it appears this way from the rear. As for the front of the aircraft, the lack of stealth-shaped leading edges in the game, for example that wedge shape we mentioned earlier, caused the initial shallower angle of the RCS to be bloated by comparison to the F-35. Otherwise, the smoother control surfaces and lack of exposed antennae and limited sensors, and, you know, lack of panel gaps, this all sort of led to a smaller front and side profile than the F-35s overall, Although those previously mentioned issues also cause it to appear somewhat bloated, I suppose, in the 2 o'clock and 10 o'clock, as well as somewhere between 5 and 7. I really can't do anything about this, so I just kind of move on. From there, with the shaping underway and a long way out from complete, we needed to focus on the radar absorbent coating a little bit so I can explain how it works to you guys. So while the shaping continues in the background here, let's talk a little bit about the second way stealth planes hide themselves, and that is material science specifically iron ball paint, or I suppose any sort of radar absorbent matrix. Essentially, imagine it this way. Every time an electromagnetic wave, including everything from visible light to x-ray, reflects or hits a surface, well, it usually bounces. 
but every time it hits the surface, it trades a little bit of its energy for heat. It's the same reason why your black driveway gets very hot in the sun. The black surface, since it absorbs more than it reflects, instead just sorta of generates heat. Radar absorbent materials, or as some call it, stealth coating, are designed to do exactly that, trade electromagnetic energy for heat. That being said, it's more difficult to absorb your typical radar microwave than is visible light, especially when mounting those materials to an aircraft. One well-established way to do this, though, is through iron ball paint or simply a radar absorbent matrix of any kind. Here's how it works. Every time that radar wave bounces off of a target, it loses energy. Because of this, the matrix contains many particulates, and once the radar wave enters it, it attempts to keep it there by conducting it along the body. Once it hits these particles, it bounces to another, and then another, until it loses enough energy to never be seen by the radar on the return. So with stealth in both shape and materials, these are some of the biggest way that stealth fighters stay hidden from aircraft. I paid special attention to keeping the frontal and side profile angles as shallow as possible, including vortex generators up and down the leading edges and around the intakes, as well as down to the nose to give us as big of a lift boost as possible. Those sharp outline edges along the sides of the intakes and fuselage not only provide a reduced cross-section from side angles, but also generate vortices down the fuselage. These vortices act as low pressure areas above the fuselage and typically generate extra lift through a special method known as vortex lift. Just watch this F-22 fly through a cloud for example. You'll notice all the way down the front fuselage, little vortices get generated and sort of create drag through the air. That's what's going to be providing our lift here. I would be simulating this extra vortex lift through an ultra low aspect wing strake blended seamlessly into the vortex generator which will act nearly identically to the real vortex generators. After this, a low aspect wing setup along with a V-tail was set. The V-tail helps reduce any noise generated from most side and shallow bottom aspects, both commonly seen by radars. At first I was going to go with a more traditional tail setup, but the reduced RCS seems slightly more valuable to me, despite the reduction in both lateral stability and potentially even a very slight reduction in maneuverability. After all, this aircraft was a multi-role and I figured not being seen was a little bit more important. Plus, the reduction in maneuverability would be like what, a half a degree a second at most? Any good fly-by-wire can deal with the lack of lateral stability anyways. Speaking of stealth, one of the most important aspects of a stealth aircraft is hiding the compressors. Let's take a look inside the LF-27's intakes. This is an S-duct. You see, the compressor and the turbine of a jet engine are made up of many spinny angles at a very high RPM. This is a massive radar source, and some planes with exposed compressors are noted to even have a bigger frontal cross-section than their real area, quite literally projecting its presence because of those compressors. So, as you could guess, visible compressors are a very big no-no in stealth aviation. Some aircraft use grates or special intake covers, but our aircraft here will use S-ducts. S-ducts are just as they sound and look, curvy S-shaped intake ducts. They hide the compressors from the radar while still allowing the aircraft to have plenty of intake air. The angle of these S-ducts will be adjusted in the future to house radars, cooling systems, and missiles as well as maintain the perfect angle to never show the compressor. It doesn't sound like too much, but juggling all these different things was rather difficult. And those intakes, of course, are feeding into the engine. So let's talk about that next. This absolute monster of a turbine, the GT-110VC, was designed to produce insane amount of thrust. With its high temperatures, this engine could produce 130 kN dry and 190 kN wet. After extensive testing at the Messier Aerospace Research Division, we discovered the afterburner could also ignite unburnt fuel from the turbine stages even under dry thrust conditions enabling the aircraft to have extra efficiency in standard cruise configuration. An engine like this would allow our craft to have a greater than 1 to 1 thrust to weight, while still being efficient enough to carry our plane with a 2,000 km theoretical combat radius, as well as an over 5,000 km ferry range with the bags. In real life, these hot burning engines you see on these aircraft require special active vane cooling to be run through the turbines to keep the metal from overheating and overstressing, but we don't have to worry about that in flyout, we just have to turn the temperature slider up. Maybe I'll do a video on how real turbines work if you guys are interested in that. Those engines, however, produce a lot of heat just like just about every other jet engine. 
and in terms of stealth, that heat would not go unnoticed. Thermal sensors available on almost all modern aircraft, such as the Russian IRST systems, mean that a hot turbine reduces stealth. To counter this, two small ram air scoops were placed in the boundary layer diverters of my craft, where we would use active fuel cooling. Active fuel cooling is where fuel is run around a turbine or nozzle to reduce temperatures. After it reduces these temperatures and in turn heats itself up, it is then run through the combustion chamber where we don't have to worry about it anymore. This helps reduce nozzle and exhaust temps, therefore cloaking your infrared signature. These sort of frontal cooling ducts would help further cool these nozzles as well as providing cooling systems for all the radar systems placed from the front to the back of the vehicle. Since this was modeled and not simulated, we sunk the nozzle into the fuselage and added air scoops in the diverters to model the visual changes to the aircraft that would occur from including such systems. Other similar reduced visibility vehicles, such as the Sukhoi 57, have been noticed to use ram air cooling as a direct nozzle and exhaust cooling system as an alternative exhaust cooling method as well. Continuing to the internals, you may note from this diagram that I have on screen now, the LF-27 contains a total of three internal weapon bays. Two rear weapon bays were capable of holding MRAMs such as the AIM-120 as well as larger weaponry such as JSOWs, JDAMs, and other air-to-ground weapons. This allowed the longsword to perform CAP, or Combat Air Patrol, or SEED, Suppression of Enemy Air Defenses, or, you know, just standard CAS and it could do all of that in the same mission without compromising stealth. The rear bay was the most simplistic of the weapons bays as well. Each bay contained a configurable 1-2 to two pylons per bay, totaling about 2-4 to four where either heavy or light armament could be installed. There wasn't a lot of room to play around with, and the bay had to be expanded to comfortably fit two AMRAMs, but otherwise it was pretty simple. The front bay, on the other hand, was a challenge. The front bay was designed to carry AIM-9s, known for tracking along the rails as they launch. This means that we cannot drop them, nor would it be very efficient to try to do so. But seeing as our AIM-9s were vertically stacked, we had to devise a way to do it. Take a look at this. Messier's patent-pending AIM-9 vertical launch system. Basically, I really hate maintainers, and I want to make sure maintainers and technicians despise me with every fiber of their being. Because of this, I developed the special launch mechanism. Here's how it works. When you have a launch request, the missile number one angles itself downwards and launches out of the bottom bay. After missile one is away, the pylon fully retracts. I made sure there was extra room behind the launch bay and between the ducts for this. After this, the next launch request angles pylon number two downwards, where it now has a full launch window to work. This pylon does not need to retract, only rotate downwards. Unfortunately, due to the way Flyout's input system works, there was no way to do this under a unified keybind, so holding down T drops the first missile into launch position, where releasing the key automatically stores it back in its bay. Y, on the other hand, launches the second missile. I like this system quite a lot because it allows the missiles to retract again if not used, as well as the fact that you can play peekaboo with it. All internal bays and doors were designed with a sawtooth shape, which helps reduce most frontal radar returns due to that wedge shape mentioned earlier. After skipping over the landing gear development really quick because it's a little bit boring, we moved on to the material selection and paint. Actually, you know what? We'll do the landing gear section. Ready? Here we go. I hope you got all that, but now it's time to move on to material selection. As mentioned earlier, stealth aircraft are covered in radar absorbent material and often have radar absorbent paint covering them as well. I cannot tell you much about these paints as I can't find any research involving them that's not classified, but I'm willing to bet it's either a radar absorbent or a simply radar transparent paint. But I'm sure you guys have all seen it though, right? Lovis roundels, text, and even camouflage can be applied to stealth aircraft seemingly without compromising the stealth of the vehicle. Because of this, I went for a grayscale digital camo across the aircraft that turned out pretty well in my opinion. On top of this, I added text to help the ground crew with a few very dumb jokes scattered across the plane. If you want to fly this for yourself, feel free to hop onto my Discord server in the description below. I'll hopefully, with any luck, be uploading this aircraft shortly after this video releases. I hope you guys can spot all the dumb maintainers notes and memes I have left across this aircraft after downloading it yourself. Moving on from there, the craft also contained various paints designed to model more practical applications. I made my own custom texture designed as a panel lining to help absorb radar. 
You see, on most stealth aircraft, all the different panels have little gaps in between them. Minimizing these gaps as much as possible can help increase stealth, but also massively increases manufacturing time and cost. In order to reduce this, we instead opted to add radar absorbent linings for these panels that would hopefully do the same thing. From there, we also included various internally mounted antennae, custom stealth doors and ports for the IPP slash APU, countermeasures, radar decoy, and emergency arrestor hooks. One of the last of the interesting things I included is the speed brake. Since it would cause severe panel gaps, a conventional style air brake was not added to this vehicle. Instead, the rear control surfaces would sort of quote unquote crumple in shape, acting as their own makeshift air brake and severely reducing speed. This would help ultimately increase stealth. And this is also why many stealth fighters do not actually have air brakes. That's most of my details on the outside of this aircraft. Since we don't have all day, I'm going to mention all the last details right now. Some of my other details are UHF antennae on the tops and bottom, L band antennae for GPS on the top and bottom, radio range finders, custom input automatic closing doors for countermeasures, emergency arrest door, IPP exhaust oriented take door, side and rear mounted ASO with radars, landing gear liners, automatic landing and taxi lights, formation, navigation, and short lines. The cockpit had a full class cockpit with HFD controls, fuel, AP, weapons controls, landing controls, camping controls, a full open canopy as well as a full open picture of my cat below. Last but not least, we had a family guy filming moments and temple runners playing on FTs for our agency pilots. And with all of that finished, it was finally time to fly out. Scarlet 2, Scarlet 1, inbound to target bullseye, heading 010. All right, hello folks. We're back with the longsword. I hope you guys enjoyed that little cinematic I gave y'all. Not very realistic, I gotta admit, but uh, it was really fun to make, so I hope you guys enjoy it. Let's start off by getting in the air here. There are 170 knots, I guess. Uh, landing gear are automatic, so you know, the lights on and all that, you just hit gear up and it automatically turns off and does all that for you. Um, I personally assumed for the gun that the keybind for firing the gun is alt so if i hit down or if i hold down alt the door pops open and the gun fires and it resets position um if you don't want it to fire on alt you can go into the keybinds and change the button to open the door it's it labeled like gun door or something so it's pretty simple to let's just pop out our weapons real quick um to open the weapons bay uh i'll be taking out the amrams because they're actually modded 
But to open the weapons bay, I believe it is you. That opens the rear weapons bay. And then you again to close it. And if you want to fire your frontal missiles, you hold down T. And that pops out the first one. Hit the fire button. It's away. Now, release T and it automatically closes. Isn't that nice? Hold down Y. Second one pops out. Fire it. Release. It closes. Nice and easy for all you pilots out there. Um, what else have we got? We also have um, countermeasure doors. So the default countermeasure button in game is R. I assigned them to R. Again, if you want to change any of this stuff, you can just find it in the inputs menu. But if you hit R, pops them open, deploys countermeasures, release R, and they close again. Pretty nice. Um, naturally, while flying a stealth fighter in real life and in flyout, well, not really in flyout because they don't have radars, but the thing about them is they aren't perfectly stealth. There is a good chance because radars gain exponential power the closer you get to them, that once you get close enough to a target, you'd still appear on radar. So if you want to do some nonsense like you saw in my video, you'd probably need to carve a pretty wide path around that aircraft to not get detected. Plus, them having theoretical uh, radars on the rear of the aircraft like this thing does would mean that you might just get spotted anyways. So that's definitely something to consider while flying this thing. If you ever do find yourself in a dogfight, you'll be pleased to know that your optimal turn speed is right around 400 knots. Let's just drop to that speed really quick. On a full tank, on a good, or on a bad day, full tank, full load, this thing gets at sea level, I'd say about um, 18, 19 degrees per second, which is still very good, of course, but it could be better. Uh, on a very good day, so you know you don't have armament or you know light armament, air-to-air -air armament, um, you know high engine power, low altitude, all that jazz, you can expect up to like 23, 24 degrees a second out of this thing, which is absolutely ridiculous. I don't know how you'd even sustain that without passing out. But yeah, 390 to 400 knots, right around there. For landing here, as you can see, you can see my crumple air brakes in action. They kind of just change angle on two surfaces and keep your plane relatively balanced, which is nice. And although they aren't insanely effective, they do help you slow down, which is ultimately their goal. Quick audio mention, the top speed limiter on the fly-by-wire system for flyout does not work. This thing can way overspeed itself and in turn drain way too much fuel. So try and keep it below, let's say about 1.1, 1.2 on the deck if you don't want to burn through all your fuel in 0.5 seconds and overstress the airframe to hell and back. Sorry for the jump cut there, folks. Um, I wanted to get myself in a different position over the airfield. Essentially, I want to show you guys how to land this thing. So, speed when you're going to land this should be right around 200 knots. This airfield is notoriously difficult to land at, but by the looks of it, I probably should have done this while I was waiting, um, headwind's going to be going down this runway, so I'm going to turn her around and try it from there. Yeah, I had to reposition myself a little bit, so I did an itty-bitty jump cut. But I hope that doesn't bother anyone too much. Alright, we don't really have all too much room to make a nice, you know, uh, crosswind... Or sorry, a nice downwind to base to final here. So our base turn's gonna have to be right here, or else our base is gonna be straight into a mountain. That's fine. You know, don't get slow. Keep ourselves right around 190 to 200. And turning in, we'll land on the left runway. There we go, nice and balanced. All right, now that we're, we have the runway made, we're gonna cut our throttle and we're just gonna let the plane glide in. Start our flare here as well, the ground effect's gonna help us not touch the ground for a bit and there we go a little bit rough but that's all right i'm kind of trying to do this one-handed anyways that's about all i have for this video oh yeah and don't forget you can open your canopy with j that's a very interesting feature to no one but uh, i figure i mentioned it anyways but i hope you guys enjoyed the video uh, i'll see you all in the next one Hopefully it won't take me this long to edit. This was actually the abridged version that I'm giving you guys. The original version that I wanted to do was going to be over 40 minutes. So hopefully you appreciate that I sped things up a little bit. I'll talk to you all in the next one.
goodbye, and enjoy your days.